It was such a joy to be with you and come and share with you this morning, be among friends and um, share God's word with you. And I've been really looking forward to this all week. I heard about um, last Sunday evening as a new vision was cast before you. And I know that that can always be a time where you take a big breath and you think, here we go again. And that's the kingdom of God. It's ever, ever increasing and advancing. But what exciting times we do live in. And so it's wonderful to be preaching in that sort of context, not one where we are maintaining or one where we're trying to hold ground or defend our place, but one where we are going forward. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And I think one of the highlights for me last year was um, in the midst of all the busyness and all the things we're doing across the nations to discover that this year, 2018, as we heard prophesied, I think Johnny brought it in his message a few weeks ago, this year we have 36 new church plants across regions beyond, which is just phenomenal. Now, if I was in Africa, everyone would cheer. And so... Um, for the Africans here, I'm disappointed. <laughs> but it's just such a joy to see that some of them in small villages, um, in homemade venues that are put up every um, Sunday morning. There's one particularly young guy, um, just amazing. I'm sitting with him. He's in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, he showed me some pictures of them putting up this awning, which is a little bit bigger than your building in different bits and pieces. And I said, wow, you do this every Sunday? He said, yes. I said, and the church? He said, well, we, we've got to cover 250 adults every week. And I think, wow, that's a setup that I've never seen before. But such a joy for us to see it. And so in some great cities of the world we're going and in some far off places. I was so thrilled to um, sing this morning in Zulu, yeah. and um, thank you so much, yes, Yabonga. Um, just such a joy to see God's Spirit moving in so many places. Um, some of the names of the places we're going, how about some of these, just very quickly. Zuelicha, that's in the Eastern Cape, an area where the Corsa people live in South Africa. This one is always hard for me, I can't really say it properly, but Danekhaudi, which is in Uttar Pradesh, on the northeastern side of, of India. Brilliant plant happening there. Here's a brilliant one, this is wonderful. The bitter root. <laughs> I don't know what you call that, bitter root family unity church. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> But uh, in the bitter route in Montana, in America, isn't that great? Among the cowboys. And um, just such a great church plant. And Heather and I'll be there in June. Little Hampton in Kent, down below here. Isn't that great? Hey, so just to name a few. And then as you heard, sorry, in? Sussex. Sussex? Yeah. It used to be in Kent last time I looked. <laughs> no, it's in Sussex. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, last week you would have heard as well that for many of us now also London awaits and in September we'll be planting Trinity Church in London. Just this last week God really spoke to us afresh some real wonderful insight because when I came to the UK and Johnny and Sheila opened up their home to Heather and I, I never dreamed we would uh, be extending our time in the UK. I thought it was for a very short period we would be here but now we're looking to extend and then this call to go to central London. And um, just to say to you that on Thursday we met with many leaders from across the city. And there are so many new church plants going into London. It's almost like God is gathering his people and preparing us for something. So I'd appreciate your prayers. When I heard about Crystal Palace, I thought, Lord, let us be ready in London that we can send some people to Crystal Palace. And uh, so when you're ready to go, I'm really trusting that, uh, for that. So really a joy. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Singing in Zulu a little bit earlier reminded me of the hub in Dubai. And um, on the final evening, for those who were there, every second here we gather uh, people from across the nations in Dubai who um, gather for a conference called the Hub where we look to empowering the movement for what we're going to do. It was a fabulous time. 
And on the final evening, um, after a busy week of prayer and worship and input, we came to the final worship session. And it was during the worship that, just like Max today, wherever you are, Max, I can't see you here. Oh, you're upstairs. Greetings, brother. <laughs> and um, Craig stood up with his guitar, lovely, deep uh, voice, Indian voice, and he started singing in Sesutu, which is the local language of the area where Heather and I come from in South Africa. And he was singing Upahame, which is be lifted up, be exalted. And I don't quite know what happened. You know those moments where during worship, God just comes. The reality of the love of God, of the Father heart of God just grips you in worship. And I'm standing there and they're singing, oh, Pahame, all these people from the nations. And then God said to me, do you remember? I'm thinking, do I remember? And God remembered, reminded me. And he said, do you remember that day you stood before your people in a barn on a farm, people sitting on hay bales, poorest of the poor, Many had never traveled outside of our area, never dreamt of the nations. Many had no geography at that stage. We were in a terrible post-apartheid season in that area of poverty and hardship. And I remember preaching a word, and God had told me, prepare your people for the ends of the earth. And during this message of preaching to the ends of the earth, you know, everybody sitting, looking, big eyes, you know. You couldn't fall asleep, as I've said to you before, in this church because you were sitting on hay bales. And um, I tell you what, they are not comfy. But they were sitting, looking, listening. And I said, I believe that your language, your voices will be heard in the ends of the earth. God's declared it, declared it over us. And, you know, it's like a lead balloon because they go... Bang, you know, but something, something happened in our hearts. And there in the hub, 21 years later, the nations are singing in Sesutu. And God said, do you remember? And last Sunday night, Richie spoke to you about Crystal Palace. And you're thinking, oh, wow. At least you can find it easily. Hey, I always look at that tower. I always said to Heather, you know why they built the Burj Khalifa in Dubai? That's the tallest building in the world. So you would know where you are. And, um, sorry, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> but you know, you look at it and you think Crystal Palace. And you listen to God and you think, what will God do through us in the years to come? What are the things that he is going to do? And I'm so grateful to God for his faithfulness because what he speaks over us, what he promises us, he is true and sees it through. Yes. Amen. And so it's a joy to be with you this morning. I haven't a clue how much time we got or what time you finish. Okay. Be careful, I'm African. <laughs> My title this morning is, Where We Are, He Is. And I want to talk to you this morning out of something that really gripped my heart over the holiday time. Heather and I were here in the United Kingdom over Christmas, our first Christmas here. And um, I spent a lot of time, I tried to put regions beyond Beulah Family Church, Trinity Church, London Plant, and all the other things that we are carrying across the nations aside. I tried to park it, which is not always easy. I've got a very busy mind and a big heart for what God's doing. And I felt I wanted to concentrate and fellowship with Jesus himself. And I'm so glad I did, because if you were listening last Sunday night, if you were here, or if you know all that we're carrying, at times you can feel extremely overwhelmed by what God's doing. I know I do. 36 new church plants. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I think, Lord, where did that come from? It's a fruitful tree. It wasn't out of some program or campaign. Sign up here. It was just birthed among us. It took us by surprise. But you can feel massively overwhelmed 
and you think, Lord, how do we carry all this? You as a church can be in the same place, getting going. You've been through a wonderful transition. It's so great to be here now. I don't know when that was. A year ago already it must be. I can't believe it. And uh, to see you now, you know, really advancing and pressing forward. But, you know, it's in the midst of this that Jesus meets us where we are. And I felt so ministered to by him, and I want to share that with you this morning. So if you have a Bible, I wonder if you turn to Mark, uh, Mark's Gospel and Chapter 7. And um, I'm starting to wear this page out in my Bible because I keep going back to it every time I start to feel a little stretched by all that's happening across the nations. I go back and I feast on this particular passage. And I want to say just three things to you this morning. And I hope it will prepare you for what God's got, but also for us as a movement. Verse 31, Jesus has been in Tyre and Sidon on the, on the coast. And it says in verse 31, he'd been there for, I understand, some eight or nine months. And it says in verse 31, then he, Jesus returned to the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, into the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephata, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. Impossible task when that happens. He charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Lord Jesus, I do pray this morning, Lord, that you would come and minister to us deeply in our hearts. No matter where we are in life, what we're dealing with, Lord Jesus, the good, the difficult, Lord, the challenging, the joys, I want to pray this morning you would come to each and every one of us here. We thank you for catching up, us up in your great story. But Lord, we know that along the way, real life happens. And so I pray, pastor of pastors, the great shepherd, come to us this morning. Speak to us deeply. Prepare this community, Lord, for all you've got for her. Amen. May she blossom, because, Lord, they know you intimately. So, Lord, would you guide us through the scripture, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to um, take you just through three thoughts from this passage. Jesus, as you know, if you read your Bible, was so clear about what he was called to do. I love the story in Mark where he is having such breakthrough at uh, Peter's home. You'll remember that he, he lifts his mom out of um, real bad fever. I tried that with Heather this morning. And I said, come on, Lord, raise her up right now. And I'm hoping he's doing it while I'm here. It hadn't happened by the time I left, but I'm walking in faith and trusting God. But he has massive breakthrough, and then they bring him the whole of the community, start lining up at his door. And it could have been a time where they could have launched the most amazing ministry. I've always seen that. I've always believed that and thought, wow, Peter must have been thinking, here we go. You know, fishermen to Peter Ministries International. But then <laughs> Jesus is gone. And it's deep in prayer, it's out of prayer that he finds God, he finds his father, and he knows this deep calling to go to the next village and the next town. So when Peter finally finds him, and he's a bit up to here with Jesus, because the program of the ministry is running behind, Jesus says, no, we must leave that. 
because I must go on and on. And that's why we do that. That's why we go to Danachaudi. That's why we go to Zvelicha. That's why we go to all these places around the nations, because that's where Jesus goes. He's purposeful. He knows where he's going. But it's in the midst of this that we see these intimate exchanges with the Savior. We see these moments where there's such clear mission and we want to be like that. That's what I gave my life to. I can remember stepping forward in a meeting and saying, God, I don't understand this. I'm a businessman, but I can see that you want your name to go to the ends of the earth. Here I am. Next thing I find myself living in the United Kingdom and a few other places along the way. And we live with that. We long for it. But what we mustn't miss is the beautiful wonder of the intimacy of Christ along the way. So he's heading back. He's been away for some time. He's going back now into the area of Galilee, his home area. And they bring him this man. They say, Jesus, lay your hands on him. We've been waiting. We know what you did back then. You've been away now. We're ready. They've brought him to Christ. These dear, caring friends and family longing to see healing of their friend or brother. It's a beautiful moment and we'll go through it. And I want you to see three things this morning. And the first one is this. Jesus knows what we need. Jesus knows what we need. When you follow the journey of Jesus, you see he responds to people so differently. Sometimes I've looked at it and thought, Lord, how did you manage that? So if you look at the passage just before the one I've read, he encounters the Syrophoenician woman. And she comes to him, her daughter is demonized, is thrashing around this little girl. She comes, Jesus, she falls at his feet, she's right there, prostrate on the ground. Jesus, heal my son. And then these words come. Let the children be fed first, but it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And you think, wow, okay, (laughs) pastoring 101. But this woman responds with faith. She knows where Jesus is going. She knows she deserves nothing. She knows she's outside at the moment, but yet there are promises to come, a grace to come that all nations would be reached. And so she enters the story with Jesus. Wonderful reply. Yes, Lord. Okay, Lord, you reign. Even the dogs under the table, where I am right now, eat the children's crumbs. Jesus said, for this statement, you may go, your daughter as well. I mean, incredible encounter. Think of when he goes to, to the, the uh, Lazarus' home. He meets Martha and she comes running up. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Can you remember what he did? He rebuked her. (laughs) And you think, whoa, okay. And then Mary comes. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. He weeps. He knows what we need. He knows what you're going through, what I'm going through, what we're carrying. And he meets us where we are. He knows as a church what you require. And it's important to note that Jesus doesn't have one method, one size fits all. Praise God. Particularly for those of us who are not left-brained and are a little bit all over the place. He knows what this man needs. He's the wonderful counsellor and he knows what you need and he knows what you need today. And so as we speak of mission, as we get excited, um, London was not something on our radar, planting a church in London. I thought I'd done all the church planting. I now love helping people plant churches until this request came. I said, seriously? Trevor Payne, are you sure about this? You want Heather and I to lead a plant into your capital. 
I said, I know we South Africans are fairly robust at times, but um, that's a big ask. And after praying about it, God just confirmed, that's where I want you. This week, Thursday, fantastic. I said, Lord, please, we need some prophetic insight because the church is built on the foundation of the apostles, the truth, and also the prophetic. The Bible tells us that in Ephesians. And a guy walked up to me and he said, I feel God wants to speak to you. He said, I don't know all the plans you've got in your heart, but he said, when Jonah was called to Nineveh, it says in Jonah 3 verse 4, I think it is, it says, when Jonah arrived in Nineveh, it is an exceedingly great city. In fact, it takes three days to cross, to walk across Nineveh. That's quite big. Sounds like London. And he said, so what God called him to do was to go into the center. And it says, Jonah walked for a day and then became, began proclaiming the word of God. The kings listened, the people listened. And he said, I don't know what's in your heart, but go to the center. And I thought, oh God, thank you. Wonderful to see. He knows what we need, but we need to be responsive. Secondly, brothers and sisters, he meets us where we are. This is an incredible passage, and to see how Jesus identifies with this poor man in Mark's account is incredible. His situation is dire. There's no national health, there's no social security, there's nothing. This man would have been really at the mercy of others, not able to communicate or take instructions or give them. We live in a much more tolerant society these days in some ways than he would ever have known. He was most probably ridiculed and laughed at. And you'd think, in this great mission, is there time for these little things happening on the sideline? And the answer is yes. Because in the midst of pressing on, in the midst of praying big bold prayers, Lord, give us London, or give us Crystal Palace, or give us Welicha, or give us Uttar Pradesh. Right in the midst of that, there is this Jesus who engages with us exactly where we are. His life would have been one of isolation. So how does Jesus react? Well, we see firstly, he identifies with him. He knows this man's situation. They bring him, Jesus, lay hands on him. He's deaf. He's, he's got a speech impediment. He's, he cannot speak properly. We know you can do something. What does Jesus do? He's not going to make a spectacle of him. He takes him aside. Did you hear that? In the, NIV, in the um, ESV it says, taking him aside from the crowd privately. Brothers and sisters, we sang some glorious songs this morning. And I'm sure you just felt God moving your heart as I did. But Jesus loves those moments where he takes us aside as individuals and meets with us where we are. He loves it. He draws us in. He's fully engaged. This is true compassion, empathy. He's entering another man's world, a man who's suffering in his isolation. Maybe you're here this morning and you never made a commitment to Jesus or even realized that he's able to remove sin and shame in your life. Maybe today he wants to take you aside privately and pour out his love in your heart. Jesus is fully engaged in his world. He meets this man. He identifies with him. God is so good. I mentioned about the hub standing there thinking, Lord, look at all these people. Look at all these nations. Look at all these things we've got to do. And God comes, do you remember? Do you remember? I promised you this now, look. And then I look up and there's Fuzzy McQuerna standing there. If you don't know Fuzzy, he's a young Basutu man. He speaks Basutu, that's his home language. He came out of our town. 
out of poverty. Now he leads what's called City Hill Church Dubai. 300 and odd adults meeting every Friday. Just got married to Emily, the most beautiful Chinese girl, building a family in the nations. And I think, wow, what a promise, God. They will hear this in the nations. Yes, they will. You may be feeling a little pressed down by circumstances, maybe frustrated by things, whatever. Allow him to meet you where you are. Allow him to minister to you. Don't think it's just mission. Let's go, let's go. We will, I promise you. But at the same time, he meets us where we are. Thirdly, I want us to see that he owns our situation. And I just love that in the story. Because when you start to, instead of just read through it and move on to chapter 8, if you just linger for a little while, you start to realize, oh wow, Jesus is actually journeying with this man. Let's just read it again quickly. So they bring the man. Jesus, it says in verse 33, takes him aside from the crowd privately. He puts his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, touched his tongue. <laughs> wow, okay. And looking up to ev heaven, he sighed and said to him, be opened. Jesus is journeying with him. Let's have a look what he is doing. He's obviously taken some of his disciples with him. They're there with him. And, you know, sometimes when we meet with God... We battle to engage with the beauty and the openness of his heart because sometimes our theology gets in the way, or bad theology. Knowing that Jesus' ability to bless us far outweighs the enemy's ability to deceive us is a key for every one of us. Where we can go aside with him, not trying to keep everything in line even as we worship this morning, call to freedom and liberty and joy, throw it off, that we can be in the safe place with him. Now we see Jesus in this man's situation. First of all, not going to make a spectacle. Takes him aside. Takes the man. He looks up. Why? Why? I think he's communicating with this man. We are going to go to the Father for your healing. It's going to come from him. All we have comes from him. All we look to comes from him. He looks up. Now, let's bring heaven into this situation. We hear then that he puts his fingers in his ears. I was praying for a guy once in Dubai and... Um, I do believe he was demonized and one of my, somebody in our church came to join me and I said, come, we're going to just lead this guy through, take him into a place of freedom and this man's on the floor and all sorts happening. And this guy who joined me said, fantastic, I've just done a course. <laughs> <laughs> I said, great. So he said, hold on, he came back and out of his Bible he brought this card and there were, I don't know who gave it to him, the 18 steps. <laughs> and I looked at this and looked at him and thought, oh my goodness, are these my people? <laughs> I said, I haven't got time for that. I'll show you a shorter way. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> this is not a method. Don't look at this and say, I'm going out in the world now and, you know, here we go. <laughs> Jesus is meeting this man where he is. He's deaf. He doesn't know what's happening. Being taken aside. Maybe he doesn't know Jesus. Jesus puts his fingers, looks him in the eyes, and says, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to open up your ears for you. And then he says, you know that tongue... That tongue that doesn't release the words. He said, I'm going to give you my words. 
in your mouth. He meets him just where he is, and you can imagine this man standing there. It's his loving saviour. He's emotionally connected. Emotionally. Out of Jesus comes what the ESV says, he sighed. I woke up in the middle of the night last night and Heather was all hot and battling with her flu and I heard, Lord, rescue me from this. It wasn't that. It wasn't a sigh of frustration. It was the sigh, I believe, of ownership. Where Jesus lets out, I think it's Tim Keller that says he let out a moan. He understood this man's pain. So out of him comes this, ah, oh, there might be a link to what he would face on the cross as well, knowing that every disease, every illness would be defeated on the cross, and that's where I'm heading. But out of him comes this deep sigh. He's connected with him. He's moved by the man's condition. And so he communicates with him. And then he says, be open. What words? Brothers and sisters, I am so excited about the future. I cannot believe the things that God has caught us up in. I cannot believe the places that God is taking us. This past Thursday was World uh, Leprosy Day. And it's leprosy is not something that in this nation we even consider, think about or whatever. But for one of our churches, or in fact many of our churches in India, it is a daily task. Because in India alone, there are over 10 million leprosy sufferers still today. And every day of the week, one of our churches, One Nation Church, send off their mobile clinic called Karuna, which is called, that means uh, compassion. Just like that beautiful hospital we saw, absolutely loved that. They go out in their mobile clinic and they've got three places across Mumbai where the leprosy sufferers, the lepers, can gather for treatment. And it looks like an RV. You go inside, I've been in, I've sat in, I've watched them. It is amazing. In one way, for me, it's a disease I don't know, so it just looks so harsh on the eyes, the suffering so immense, particularly when you realize that the person they're treating, once they leave the van they're back on the streets there's no home to go to they live on the streets many of them and to watch them and it's kitted out with showers and a bath and it's got the clinic and the place for dressing and the place for prayer and they just minister to all these people because there's so many it happens out on the sidewalk you know so we're sitting out there watching this thinking wow There's a great work ahead of us. But in the midst of it, there is this Jesus who meets us where we are. He meets you where you are. And if you have any uncertainty, oh, I'm not sure I signed up for this, join the club. That's my club. I've got the rights to those words. But you can just settle knowing whatever God calls us to do. If we go to multi-services, if we release people, if we send them, if some move into London, if we have to say goodbye and release, we know, wow, there is this Jesus who sticks his fingers in our ears, gives us a little bit of spit when we need it. And he says, come on, be open. Be open to what I want to do. Be open to my call in your life. Be open to all I have for you. Do you remember the leper that comes to him? Falls and he says, Jesus, if you would, sorry, if you are able to, would you heal me? Remember this word Jesus says, if I'm able to. I mean, do you know who you're talking to? You know, if I'm able to, so, you know, I'm sure, yeah, amazing. And then if you read on, it says, 
sorry, Yuma leper. So he comes, he falls. If you're able to, would you heal me? So many times Jesus just spoke, Syphonician woman, you can go, your daughter's well, to the centurion. Go home, it's fine. In this case, it says he reaches out and he takes hold of the leper. Come here quickly. I, not often I have to hug a very tall man. I'm usually the one bending down. This is quite fun. But he takes hold of him. <laughs> <laughs> When last did the leper know a human touch? When last did somebody grab him where he used to have an ear or put a hand on his face? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> He takes hold of him, brothers and sisters, and he meets us where we are. And when we're overwhelmed and we're thinking, God, this is too big for us, he can say, no, hang on a second. It's not. Because it's not about us. It's about him. Amen. Mark, recording this gospel, spots something or was instructed in something, I don't know. But he uses the, the original word in the writings. Forgive me, I am not a great scholar. But phonetically it's mogli lelos is the word that describes this man's condition. So if you were to say he was deaf and had a speech impediment, the word used is mogli lelos. It's only used once in Scripture besides Mark's Gospel. Isaiah chapter 35. Because Mark wants us to look back. Because in Mark 35 verse 5 it says, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing with joy. Hallelujah. Mark is saying, Jesus is our king. Just as Isaiah prophesied. Amazing. I don't know what all the future holds. If Heather was here this morning, she'd be looking at me from the front row. Because she often says... Um, are you able to just guide me a little bit of what the future holds? Because we were in Clarence, South Africa. We sat on our front veranda and you said to me, and I said to you, I'm not sure I could do a big move ever again. A year later, we're in the Middle East. And then we got to a point where you said, it's almost time to go home. Now in the UK for two years. And now we're going back to South Africa to get another three-year visa. Can you guide me at all in the future? And you think, actually we can't. Because what we have, we, we hold lightly. What you have as a church, you hold before God, because that's why we do what we do. We say, Lord, I don't know what the future holds, but hey, I know to one I can come. When my ears are aching, when my tongue's stuck, I know who I can come to. When my heart is broken. I heard of a dear friend this week who... body has been ravaged by illness. I felt so, I felt so bereft. I thought, no. Having to make substantial changes now because of health issues. And I got before God. God just reminded me of this. Um, you know what you're preaching at Penge on Sunday? Allow me to come right now. I sat there, I had such peace, Lord, 
You've got your hand on them. You're with them. He meets us where we are. Let me close with this. We mustn't forget to look up. All that we do comes from God. All that we are comes from Him. And it's lovely to hear you referring to a prayer meeting this morning. Prayer has to become our engine room in all that we do. Remember, Jesus looked up. Secondly, he sighed. In my nation of South Africa, I want to be honest with you, we suffer from poverty fatigue. Where you can just become blind to it. I notice in London when we go through to some meetings there on a Thursday when all the churches gather, you go through so many street people, rough sleepers, whatever they are termed. You can just become blind. Don't forget the sigh where we as the church can enter the world's pain. The touch. Complicated in this society at the moment. But to be able to say with people, hey, I'm with you. Oh, I'll pray for you when I get time. No, I'm with you. I've got you. Because Jesus has got me. And then, the word, be opened. We have the answers. We have the answers.